to turn it over to Denise, uh, who's going to give us an update on the Global Patient Registry. Okay, are you seeing my slides? Yes. Great, thank you very much. And thank you, Hugh. It's hard to follow you, but it's great to follow your energy. Um, thank you everyone for listening. Um, I am gonna give you an update on the EHE Global Patient Registry. And I'm reminded by Hugh's comments um, to just make sure that you know that this is patient entered data um, versus clinician entered data. Um, so we do have different types of registries that take place. Um, and this one is one that is run um, by patients and, and driven by patients. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the study who can join this study, um, give you insights into the survey responses that we've seen so far, and talk to you a little bit about future perspectives with the registry data. So this is a natural history study that aims to describe people who are diagnosed with EHE. Um, we want to learn about the demographics, the presentation of EHE in people, how it is different, um, how that disease varies over time, how, how EHE and the symptoms present and change over time. Very importantly, we want to observe treatments that people utilize, um, what those management patterns are, and then really importantly, what the outcomes of those treatments are as reported by patients. Again, this is patient reported data. And keep in mind that sometimes um, the information that patients say about how a treatment worked for them is different than what is captured in the clinical care notes. Um, often we, we hear that more reported from symptoms, um, but also how that how that treatment worked for that patient and then over a long period of time. We want the data to support the development of best practices and management guidelines over time and standards of care. We also hope that the data could be useful in advocating for expanded coverages for treatments where that is appropriate. Um, and importantly, really uh, the biggest thing here is to inform patients and the research community. This information coming back to you after you hear and we analyze data from lots of patients over time will be important. Um, it builds knowledge in this community. It helps to improve care and, and it will advance research. So the study is run by the EHE Foundation. It is sponsored. Every study has to have a sponsor and the EHE Foundation took upon um, ourselves to sponsor this, but it is a global partnership really with all of the EHE groups around the world and importantly, patients around the world. Um, we sponsored it and we administer it, which means that I, as the principal investigator of the registry and I serve currently as the coordinator as well, have to have the appropriate training um, we have to have the appropriate ethics approvals. Um, we have the appropriate processes and systems in place with which to run this registry. Um, and those have been assessed by an external independent review board and we've been given approval. The registry itself is hosted on the NORD, that's the National Organization for Rare Disorders, um, I Am Rare platform. Um, NORD uh, serves only rare diseases and diagnosis. Um, this platform was uh, built with the collaboration of the FDA um, in making sure that they understood when building the registry how FDA would want to look at this type of data that would be donated for pa from patients. Um, you should know as participants or if you're considering joining this registry that data that you transmit to the registry, so when you're entering data about yourself or when data is coming back to you, it is encrypted. Data that is stored in the registry is also encrypted. Um, there is a lot of security around this, uh, around the database. Researchers can apply with ethics approval. They can apply to access study de-identified data. They cannot access identifiers. We are never allowed to share identifiers of people in this registry. Um, one thing that's not on this slide, but I do wanna call out, um, when you join the registry, you have options of how you would like to be contacted. And one of the really important parts of the registry is identifying people for other studies, so clinical trials or other study opportunities. So you have the option to say, yes, I'd like to be contacted for other relevant study opportunities. You also can elect that you don't want any contact at all, um, but that is an important aspect of the registry. 
I want to say and and make sure that you know that anyone living anywhere in the world um, can who is diagnosed with EAG can join this registry. You do have to have access to the internet. Um, it is only an electronic registry. There are no paper forms um, for this registry. But anywhere in the world, 18 years or adults who are 18 years or older um, can consent on behalf of themselves. I will say that um, in some cases where there's an adult who cannot um, answer the questions in the registry um, for their, maybe their health is too poor. Um, an adult, a legal adult can answer, they can join and register on their behalf. Children who are under 18 must be represented represented by a parent or a legal guardian. Um, children under 18 are not allowed to join on their own. Um, we are including deceased persons. So if someone is deceased from EHE um, and often a, a spouse or um, a sibling will add that person to the registry, but we it is important to capture those journeys. So we wanna have that information in the registry when people um, are able to provide that data. Um, as I mentioned, it's all online. So the informed consent is electronic. You read the informed consent. If you agree to the consent, then you sign that, you can download that. And then those surveys are then available for you to answer. It's all in English currently. So I wanna dive a little bit into the participant characteristics that we've learned. Um, this is not an analysis. The, these are simple summaries um, for illustration purposes here. We want you to know what we're capturing and what we're seeing in the registry. So the registry has been active now for 11 months. We have 220 consented participants who are taking surveys. Um, there are more people who have registered that have not started taking their surveys. Um, but look at the distribution by country. Um, we have 24 countries represented here. Um, so you can see that people from all over the world tr truly are donating to this important project. Um, currently, we have 73% female and 27% male participants. Um, that, is, that is important to note that it doesn't track along with the published literature. Um, we see in published literature that there's a slight predominance of females to males. Um, we don't know why this is, and we'll see how this looks over time. Does this balance out a little bit? Um, and then in the upper right, um, I'm looking at age of participants. This does track with the literature where we see that um, EHE has a higher incidence in the fourth and fifth decades of life. So see here, you see that um, in that 35 to 64 age categories where we have the greatest number of participants um, in the registry. And then down in the lower right, years of lived disease. Um, so these are how many years since diagnosis people have reported. Um, we have the largest number of people in that one to three year category. So newer diagnosed, but not new as diagnosis. Um, we have a number of people in the three to 10 year um, range. And then thankfully we have a lot of people here in the 10 plus years. And we want more people who have that longer lived disease so um, it's important to know what has gone on in that journey over that time period. And we're grateful to those people that have joined the, joined the study. So again, a little more dive into the data that we're learning. So we ask about your disease presentation. Again, remember, it's important to know um, where were your tumors when you were diagnosed? And then how are those tumors changing? How are your symptoms changing over time? So we have surveys. There's a diagnosis survey. It asks you, um, about your disease pre presentation when you were diagnosed. And then there's a survey that says, um, what is your current disease? That's a separate survey. And we, we call that current baseline. So essentially we wanna know if you were diagnosed 10 years ago, where did you have tumors? And then today, has that changed? And you, and you report that to us. So you can see that this um, tumor location tracks right along with the liver literature where we have liver and lung um, both in local um, one organ disease presentation, but in metastatic disease, liver plus lung, still that's our highest category. Um, if we added another category to this um, in looking at the data, I can tell you that it would go to liver, lung, and bone. Um, you can see that there's a high other, a higher other category here. Um, having looked at that data, I can also tell you that some of those are going to go and be attributed to bone. They're gonna be attributed to muscle where people have answered. And instead of clicking bone, they clicked 
or they they entered in the specific bone in their body. Um, so those would kind of jump over into those other categories. Importantly, too, um, we're look at, looking at signs and symptoms of disease. So we ask people prior to your diagnosis, um, and you just heard talk about the incidental finding, Dr. Rubin was talking about this, about not knowing you had cancer, but we ask people prior to your diagnosis, did you have any signs or symptoms that might have been attributed to EHE? Um, and then we also ask at baseline when you join the study, what are your current signs and symptoms? And you can see here that um, pain at tumor site remains very high. Um, abdominal, abdominal pain and fatigue are also very high. But also here in the none category, that is that's none reported at prior to diagnosis. So people said, I didn't have any signs or symptoms that, that I thought were associated with EHE. So we want to continue to follow these data along because we wanna see how do these signs and symptoms correlate with these tumor locations and these tumor changes? How do all of these fit together? And then we tie that in with the treatments um, that we're also seeing reported. I wanna call out a couple of other just um, data points here. 21% of people in the registry have reported that they received a misdiagnosis before they got their EAG diagnosis. And you heard mentioned um, previously, both um, by Dr. Rubin and Dr. Chen about angiosarcoma. So seven people in the registry reported that they had been given a diagnosis of angiosarcoma as their initial diagnosis. And then that diagnosis was changed to EAG. So again, this, this illustrates the importance of having that expert um, sarcoma pathology uh, consult, a second a second confirmation um, if need be to know um, that you have EAG. And then 82% um, of people in the study um, do not know what their gene fusion is. So again, um, Dr. Rubin pointed to the two gene-defining fusions for EHE. 18% um, of the people in, this, in the registry report that they know that they have the TAS CAMTA fusion, um, but 82% of people do not. And, and while this is not um, critical to know, again, as, as Dr. Rubin said, uh, we think that that will be information that going forward, some of this information you might want to know and could be informative to your care. So I wanna to touch here. Um, so there are surveys regarding your medical history. Um, there are pain reports, and then there's global health scale. Um, so in medical history, we're asking you, were you diagnosed with any other diseases or do you have any other disorders to report? Um, and there's an extensive list, um, but here we see that 44% of people who um, have received an EHE diagnosis report that they have no other health issues. Um, and then 14% of people in the registry have reported that they have another cancer. So this is different than what I was just saying about a misdiagnosis. These are people who have EAG and they have another cancer. And then down here, I've called out that breast and skin were the most commonly reported other cancers. Um, I want to also note that those are very low numbers, like four and five of each of those. They're not very high numbers but there are people who have um, EAG and another cancer. And then I wanna also just note here in this other category of other um, diagnoses that people have, because we often get this question in the community about um, our diseases related as one disease cause another disease. And we wanna, over time, people want to study that. So we wanna capture this, but I can tell you that in that other, those are all, single diagnosis. There are no combinations of, you know, two people with the same diagnosis. Those are all unique um, reports in that data. Um, regarding pain, um, so this is an understudied and much unmet um, medical need for people with EHE uh, related pain. So we're asking um, throughout the, the uh, registry, your participation, this is at baseline. So we ask, this is just a three question scale. So this is one of two pain scales. Um, very simple. Um, I'm just showing you, again, for illustration purposes, this is not an analysis um, that, you know, a, a number of people are saying at baseline that they had no pain, but we do have a number of people that are reporting out to severe and very severe pain. So we want to understand better how to treat that pain. And then the global health scales, understanding how EAG is affecting your quality of life, how it is affecting your social activities, your work, all of those things are very important. 
So this is going to be of interest to everyone. Um, this, we hope, will be of significant interest also to the research community um, and clinician scientists that we invite to interrogate this data. Um, this is uh, treatment utilization reported at baseline. Again, I want to stress this is not an analysis. These are simple summaries. Um, so I'm pulling out here what people said that they had used for treatment at baseline, so when they joined the registry. Um, I want to highlight that in the lower left, 37% of people reported that they'd never had any interventional treatment. Um, they'd never had any treatment for their EAG. Um, we've categorized those people into that active surveillance. You heard Dr. Chen talk about active surveillance, um, also called wait and watch. Um, people are often asking about, you know, is this okay for me? A lot of people are in that category, obviously. 63% had said that they did have a treatment um, at their time of entry into the study. And we dissected that here into these different treatments used. Um, and we do know that some patients have used multiples of these treatments. Um, so maybe they've had one, but they also could have had multiples of these treatments. Um, not surprisingly a little bit, Surgery and systemic therapy here are the larger um, pieces of this pie. We want to dive into this. We want to know um, how these treatments have been used, um, what sequence were they used in, how, what was the outcome of these treatments um, with these patients. And then here, um, kind of in the middle, there's a table. Again, this is just a simple summary count, um, and it's you know sorted in order of use. Um, but you see a lot of ones and twos here. Um, I can tell you that some of these agents were used in combination. Um, some of them are used as single agents, but we want this information to grow. We know there are more people out there who have used systemic therapy. We are asking, when did you start this therapy? When did you stop this therapy? Um, how did this therapy work for you? Did it control your symptoms? Did it reduce your tumors? Did your tumors increase, but your symptoms reduced? So those are important things to understand. And then importantly also, why did you stop taking that treatment? Um, did, you, um, did your disease stabilize and you decided to come off treatment? Did your disease progress and you needed to come off treatment to do a different intervention? So there is a large analysis that needs to be done behind all of this data. Um, I'll point over here to pain, man pain management on the right. Um, so we're looking at pain management strategies, um, again, understudied and unmet in this community. So we really want to learn from everyone who's used different pain management techniques and how those worked out. Um, not surprisingly, oral pain medication is the top use, um, but we hear people asking about pain pumps and other pain management strategies. So we wanna to continue to grow this data. So quickly, I just want to touch on um, how to share your journey. Again, um, for those of you who may have joined, maybe you've joined and you're stuck, um, or you are all, already a study participant. So you can go to eheregistry.imrare.org. Um, you click register. It's in the top right corner of the page um, and add your basic information. So that's kind of like adding your contact information. You're just getting a, an account, if you will, on the, on the platform. And then you have to go through a two-step verification process. If you don't complete this step, um, this is a security feature, and if you don't complete it within a couple of hours, it actually locks you out, and you'll have to email for assistance to get back in. It won't let you back in. Um, for people who are adding a person who is not themselves, if you are not the person who has EHE and you are a legal representative of a person, um, the participant, you're adding a participant, and that is the person who has EHE, and then you can consent and then take um, the surveys. For those of you who have joined the study, um, answer as many surveys as you can. You can do this at your own pace, um, but you, we are pushing six-month updates. Um, if you've not had any changes in your EHE, maybe you haven't had any new intervention, no treatments, it's about a two-question answer to say, no, nope, nothing new, and then you're done. Um, if you've had any changes, those changes are important for us to capture, so please go in and, and, and share those. I want to talk on what we'd like to see for the future of this project, because this is a long-term project. Um, importantly, we want to increase enrollment. So if you take 220 people, you dissect that down into a large number of people that have never been treated, and then those who have had treatment and the types of treatment they've had, um, 
you can see quickly that we need more people um, and we want to hear from more people who've had longer lived disease, from people who've had longer lived disease without many treatments or any treatment and those that have had um, any treatments at all. So literally, if you've had, if you are diagnosed with EHE or if someone you um, love has been diagnosed with EHE, please consider this opportunity. We do need to conduct a statistical analysis. We really need to understand how these um, data points correlate with one another and understand this disease. We want to explore pathology and the confirmatory diagnosis of EHE. So that is really important for us because for us to share this data and to advance research, we want to, in, we want to ensure that we're including people who actually have an EHE diagnosis. Um, and by adding that um, data in here, then we'll have that to share um, with interested researchers. And then I mentioned earlier um, that language translation, uh, so we have the, the surveys are only available in English. We know that people are um, successfully using AI, Google Translate to um, translate the surveys and answer them accurately, um, surprisingly very accurately, um, but we would like to translate this to reach more people on the planet. We think that that's very important. Um, and I really want to say thank you to everyone who's joined this project. Um, this was developed with patients, with advocates, um, with clinician experts, um, but really it only um, comes to life with patient participants. So thank you very much for joining. If you have any questions at all, please email me at registry at fighteh.org. Thank you.